have you ever heard uh, your narcissistic client admit that uh, they have uh, intentionally manipulated uh, the partner, for example? Uh, Being detached? To try to, to trigger their abandonment to, so that yes. they'll stop complaining and being or critical. Or uh, asking, uh, would you like the theater or the cinema? Yes. And then, uh, yes. why do you like the cinema, yes. etc. Well, they don't actually even know they're doing it. That's the thing. So I don't think it is intentional. I think it's just that they have an idea of what's best. And if someone doesn't pick the answer that they've already chosen, they feel insulted. And so they criticize the partner. They don't even know that they did it. If I say, look, you offered two choices. That was very nice, very gallant. You know, what would you like to do? Would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? And then your partner says, I'd like to do that. And you say, what? That's stupid. And I say, well, it is stupid, they say. I'm just saying what's true. I mean, she picked a stupid choice, but you gave her the choice. Yeah, but she should know better. They don't know even that they've, they wouldn't see it as a manipulation because they weren't planning it to manipulate. They actually see themselves as they have the right answer. It's almost like a test in a way, but it's not a conscious test. Mm -hmm. It's like I have the right answer, you pick, and let's see if you get the right answer. Mm -hmm. So they don't know that they're necessarily setting it up that way. And they'll often feel like they're doing a good service. You know, when I, when I offer my son all these flavors of ice cream, I saw this one time happen right in front of my eyes. I offer my son all these flavors of ice cream. Pick any one you want, any one you want. And the little boy picks this very funny colored ice cream. It's like mixed colors, like a rainbow. And the dad goes, what? That's ridiculous. That's not even ice cream. That's so, why would you pick that? And the little kid is so embarrassed in the ice cream store in front of everyone. He goes, oh, all right, well, then I'll just get the chocolate. Good choice, says the father. But if you say to that father, why would you manipulate him like that? He said, I wasn't manipulating him. I just, I just couldn't believe he picked that. I'm just teaching him. Mm -hmm. No, no, you're, you, it's like baiting him. You put the bait out, and then you, you catch him. But they wouldn't say it's a manipulation. They might say, yes, I wanted to hurt my partner. Yes, she hurt me. I'm going to hurt her right back. In this, but they feel justified. In, not, not in this particular... No, no, with a partner. They might feel, in some cases, if you say to them, did you do that on purpose? Were you trying to be manipulative? Were you trying to hurt her? They might say, she hurts me, I hurt her right back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Uh, for example, in which... Uh, oh, it could be in a divorce situation, mm -hmm. could be about money, could be about parenting, could be about the kids, could be anything, could be... Yes, but know, not in this particular move, not in this particular manipulation. What do you mean? Um, in, not in this particular manipulation, you think they are not uh, intentional. No, they'll say they are intentional, uh -huh. but they'll say that they feel justified. Uh -huh. They rationalize it. So they'll say, yes, I did do it on purpose. I did it. A manipulation. Yes. I do. Well, manipulation or just this act of, of pain or abuse or unkindness or whatever it might be. Unkindness, yes. I, I don't see narcissists as being as devious as most people do. So I don't think they're so devious that they're thinking about how can I manipulate you. I don't see them that way. I mean, at the far end of the spectrum, maybe, closer to sociopathy, psychopaths, you know, maybe more manipulative, more deviant. I just think we all are, we're all manipulative as human beings. We manipulate the world to make it work for us, right? But that doesn't mean we're bad. It doesn't mean we're devious. Manipulation is not a bad word. It just can be used in a bad way if it's to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think narcissists sit around thinking about ways how to hurt people, but they will justify the right to hurt someone if they've been hurt. So sometimes, yes, they do things very much. I'll say, yes, I did do that. I, I yelled at her and I called her names to make her know what it feels like when she ignores me. Mm -hmm. They feel very justified. And... So I don't see it as manipulation as much as I just see it as their entitlement. Uh, and when they, uh, they, they detach, they appear detached, uh, mm. 
do you think that uh, they know that it is a seductive move or? Uh, no, sometimes it's just automatic. Sometimes it's just the, it's the way they are. They just detach when they get uncomfortable. Um, sometimes it is a way if they if there's an angry child present, meaning that if the partner is saying to the narcissist, I don't like it when you do this, why don't you do that, I feel really sad, I'm very hurt, I'm disappointed. The partner isn't doing anything wrong by talking about their hurt or their disappointment, but the narcissist can't handle it. Because what they hear through their schemas, through their filter, is that they're being blamed, that they're no good, that they're humiliated, that they're, they have to try harder. They hear it like they heard it when they were young. Mm -hmm. And they become so frustrated and angry that they shut down. And they know that when they shut down, it might trigger their partner's abandonment. They know, so they are aware of that. They may or may not be. Mm -hmm. They may be, they may not be. I mean, some of the things we do, we do just automatically. We've learned it, it's a habit, and we know it works. And if they know it works, it's like a little child who knows that, you know, if I, if I throw something on the floor, it's going to make my mother angry, and then she'll know how I feel. Right? So some of it might be deliberate. And some of it might just be automatic. Yeah, I so, we, we just don't, we don't, we don't have a view of the patient as being devious or we don't see them that way. We see them as being vulnerable at the core with these very difficult modes that they've constructed to protect themselves. Oh, and, and these modes might hurt people. So we see them as vulnerable at the core. We don't see them as devious. We don't look at them as bad. We look at them as having these constructs to protect themselves that we have to address. We have to confront. We have to try to break down the walls. We have to try to set limits on the parts that are very dangerous or hurtful. Um, but we know that at the core, they're vulnerable, right? And manipul calling people manipulative sounds so blaming. So we're not, we don't blame the patient. We just hold them responsible. Of course, yes. Yeah. I just wonder if uh, sometimes they admit uh, to do something uh, intentionally being aware. Yeah. If they feel like they want you to hurt, if they feel upset, you know, it's what passive aggressive tendencies can look like sometimes. So you have a patient who, one of my narcissistic patients would always end up coming home late and he'd say, um, the more she demands, makes demands on me, the more I'm not going to show up on time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a passive aggressive way mm -hmm. of is he doing it on purpose? Yes, he's doing it on purpose. But he feels entitled to do it on purpose because he feels like she's being difficult, he's going to be difficult. Right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't solve the problem, of course. Just makes things worse, but they do it anyway. And uh, so I always wonder, how, how can they uh, be all so smart? It's impossible. So there is something inside them that uh, guides the, the survival. The, yeah, survival. It's a survival. Mm -hmm. It's a different form of survival. They don't go home and cut themselves, mm -hmm. like borderline patients. They don't. They don't necessarily have the destructive, self-destructive, direct self-destructive tendencies like borderline patients. They have more. We call insidious self-destructive tendencies that may, over time, they may get sick from drinking and drugging, they may lose their money if they spend and they gamble, but they're not directly assaulting themselves. Mm -hmm. So their survival is just different. Their survival is very strong, very tough. Some of it, I think, is just temperament. Some of it is watching their family members, but their survival is really more of a, it's clever. <laughs> they're clever. They're yeah, very <laughs> clever, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, their moves are uh, similar. All of them has uh, similar tactics, the similar strategies. Pretty similar. Pretty similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the couple uh, relationship, for example. Mm -hmm. More or less. Um, 
similar modes, but maybe different styles within the mode. Yeah. Some detached protective modes are more quiet. Some are tougher. Um, some of the fighter or self-aggrandizing modes. Some narcissists are not. They're not show-offs. Mm. They're not. In fact, they're more quiet types who don't. They may be very controlling, but they don't walk around talking about themselves like they're wonderful. In fact, they don't talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. So. They have the same modes, but they show up differently in the modes, some of them. And some are exactly the same. But I wouldn't say they're all identical, because narcissism has a range of possibilities. Oh, yes, yes. I am struck always when I see the similarities, because... Uh, it's just survival, and they learned it at a very early age. Ah. How to live in the world, how to deal with the things they feel uncomfortable with. Um, they know how to be charming, they know how to make people like them, um, and they know how to push people away, even though they don't know they're doing it. But they're not so aware of the outcome. In other words, it doesn't really work, because they end up pushing people away, and they end up having people not like them very much. But they can make certain things work very well in their career. So in their careers, they can be very strong, successful, and powerful in their careers because they're you know, very good at just focusing on what they have to do, working hard, being successful. I would not use the word manipulation. Yes. I would say they still have those modes even in the workplace. They know how to survive and they also know how to be very successful because they're detached. So they can be, you can be a great surgeon, you can't even be a good surgeon if you're not detached. You can't be thinking about the emotions of the family members outside or the emotion of the person on the table, you've got to be pretty detached. Mm. The problem is they can't stop being detached when they leave the surgical room, the operating room. But it does make them good at what they do. My radiology doctors, my surgeon doctors, my neurology doctors, they're very good at what they do. They're the top of their class because they're really good at being detached. And they're really smart. Uh, listen, uh, you, you are right saying uh, you don't uh, call that uh, manipulation because it is a survival and it is a self-defense. Uh, self, uh, but uh, when it, they, it happens in the relationship, uh, there are victims because uh, the other side of uh, the relationship may... Well, there's, there's victims, but you also have to ask... We have to ask the question about the partner who is a quote-unquote victim, why they're stuck. Um, Not to blame them. I don't blame them. I'm just be curious. I'm always curious with when I meet women who are partners of narcissists, why are you staying in the relationship? Why do you tolerate this? Why is it hard to stand up to this person? Are they dangerous? Are you afraid? Is it your children? There's reasons, usually. But, yes, they are being, sometimes they're really suffering from the mental abuse and, and hopefully not physical abuse, but from being ignored, from being criticized, from having a partner who's just so self-absorbed and shut down. Uh, but we have to be curious about the partner too. You know, what? why are they accepting it? Uh, yeah, but... Um it's difficult to be uh, to to put the question why they are accepting without blaming. No, you have to say I'm not blaming you. This isn't blame, but I am curious about what makes it difficult for you. I've asked countless women this question. Some of them will say, "Are you blaming me?" I say, "Absolutely not." But I just want to understand what is it that keeps you in the relationship. What have you already tried to stand up for yourself? What have you tried so far to meet your own needs? What have you tried even to, to see if your partner will go to therapy? Um, and they'll say, well, it's not my responsibility. I say, no, it's not your responsibility to fix it. It's only your responsibility to, to look after yourself, to make sure that you're okay. And some of the women I work with will say that they can't leave because they have little children and they don't want to leave their little children with these difficult men. Mm-hmm. I get it. I respect it. I understand it. It's a big and sacrifice, but it's all that they're able to do right now. And some of them love them. They love them. 
Like I said, part of the reason I wrote my book was inspired by some of the women I was seeing who, they loved these men. They could see their vulnerability underneath the self-aggrandizer or the bully or the critical parts or the detached parts. They could see some of the vulnerability and, and they loved them. They wanted their partners to be well and they wanted to support them healing. But they were tolerating a lot of pain to do it. And I always said to say to them, I'll support you either way. If you want to go, I'll support you to go. And if you want to stay, I'll support you to stay, as long as it's not dangerous and you're safe. I said, I will support you on either side that you want to go, because there's no wrong if you choose to leave, and it's not wrong if you choose to stay. We just have to make sure that you're safe and that you don't have to pay such a high price emotionally either way. Right? So it's really taking a very personal look at the partner and making sure that whatever choice they make is going to ultimately meet their needs so they can be healthy. And uh, what uh, help uh, them to leave their relationship? Mm, sometimes it's just a matter of, of working on their own self-sacrifice issues or subjugation issues or if it's someone who has strong defectiveness issues and they don't feel good enough someone who has abandonment schema where they don't feel comfortable being alone and they're terrified that they're going to be alone forever. So just like we would do with the narcissist, we have to work on the schemas of the partner so that they can be, you know, they can free up their healthy, vulnerable self and know that it might be hard going out into the world alone and leaving a relationship, but, you know, if they're staying only because they're like a prisoner to their own old early beliefs then they're not really making their own choice mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're choosing from your healthy adult side whatever you choose that it's coming from the healthy adult whether it's staying or going and that choice gets suspended until they really have a good connection with their vulnerable child what we are uh, talking about is um, inside a relationship where the women have uh, less power than the, than the men. Some do. Some have a lot of power. They just don't know they have it. But they have a lot of power. And some of them are very powerful, actually, in the relationship. And, I mean, especially if the women happen to be the narcissists. They can be very powerful in the relationship. No, no. I mean when the, um, there is an asymmetry in the favor of the male, mm -hmm. which is the most common uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. situation. Um, if they have subjugation issues, issues of abuse, it can feel just like it did when they were very young. Yes. It can feel like that. But remember, this is a woman in a relationship. What I try to help the women I treat realize is that to the part of you that's very vulnerable, this may feel just like it did when you were young. You feel abused. You feel like you don't matter, you feel weakened, you feel less important, and there may be a theme in your life, so this feels just like that to you, and you follow the same order you did when you were little to cope with it. That's not your fault, it's just what you're used to, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. But you're not that little child. I mean, ultimately what I want the partners to realize is that they're not that little child, therefore they're not really helpless, they're not really victims, they're just people who are struggling just like the narcissist, they're stuck in their coping mode. They're stuck in a coping mode where they feel either too vulnerable or they feel disconnected. There's women who even feel terribly disconnected from the partner and they just shut down. They drink, they eat, they shop and they don't look after themselves, they don't, they avoid the conflict because they feel helpless. That's not their fault. But just like the narcissistic partner, they're also triggered at a very deep level and don't see any way out. And um, so I don't see it like, you know, the women are helpless victims and the men are these terrible monsters. I don't see that. I see that there's cultural and sometimes um, generational issues that make for these really traditional, uneven, unbalanced relationships, but once you 
Once you look deep underneath and you see that, oh, I'm, I'm buying into this. I don't have to buy into this. I don't have to accept this. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was when I was little. It doesn't have to be that way now that I'm an adult. I can make other choices. That's not easy. I'm not saying it's simple, so, but it's important. It do, if uh, you were some of uh, the uh, anti-violence uh, centers, uh, you know there are uh, these centers for uh, uh, for people. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I used to run a shelter for battered women uh, many good. years ago. <laughs> so, and uh, good. And um, if uh, they receive, they ask for help mm -hmm. by a person who has this kind of situation of a relationship with a narcissistic person. What do you advise them? If they're in a dangerous, violent situation, they need to get out. Yeah, but uh, in this case, we, it's not, uh, the, the most part of uh, narcissists are not... Uh, well, some are, but not all. You're right. No, yes. Most of them are critical and yes. they ignore their it's partners. Just, uh, it's just a psychological... Uh, kind of violence? It's not even violent, always. Oh, Sometimes good. it's just psychological, you know, psychological deprivation. It's more emotional deprivation. Or they may be critical. Mm, they may be, they may constantly be threatening to leave. They may be putting their partner down. Is it a mental kind of abuse? Mm -hmm. mm. So if that's what you mean, a kind of psychological, mental, emotional abuse, yes, it can be. It can be very it can feel very abusive. And that's why I said if someone were to come to me looking for safety or a way out because the emotional abuse was making them so depressed that they were maybe feeling suicidal or just feeling so mm -hmm. like they couldn't get well, they couldn't work, they couldn't function, then maybe the best thing for them to do is to leave the relationship or even leave it for a while and take care of themselves. Yes, if it's possible, but it's not always possible. It's not always easy mm -hmm. to leave. Um, and sometimes it's, they know they shouldn't, but uh, they don't do. They, they yeah, I mean, I think because oftentimes their own schema activation is so strong and they have messages in their mind that say, you know, you can't fail. <coughs> but the problem is that if you put them in treatment or you send them mm -hmm. in treatment, uh, in the... In the couple relationship, they take the role of the bed of the wrong person. Yeah, the, see, the problem with the, this, Pierre, and I, I don't know if no, I... No, 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 it's okay. The problem with this, your, some of the questions, Pierre, is that there's not an answer that fits everyone. Mm. Right? So there's no... I don't make any... There's general principles about the way person, the personalities look in narcissists. They have certain constructs that we look at over time where we see these aggrandizing sides that are very tough and, and fighters, right? We see these detached sides that shut down and self-soothe and self-stimulate and disconnect. We see this lonely, vulnerable part underneath. They can be with a variety of different types of partners. Partners who have self-sacrifice issues, partners who are borderline and have a lot of different schemas, partners who are just feel very defective or have abandonment issues. So there's not like a one-size-fits-all when it comes to how it looks in treatment, except that you can predict certain things about the narcissist and how they're going to show up. But the partners can really vary. You can have women who are, or even men, but women who are very strong, and they stay because of their kids. But you have, or you can have women who feel very weak. They feel very, very vulnerable, and they're terrified of leaving because they're afraid of looking like a failure, being alone. So there's... No, I, I, put, I have uh, mentioned the case of uh, the, the woman who want to, want to live but mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. Can't because? Because of uh, psychological reasons. Okay. And that's the, the case I... So but even I, psychological I think reasons can be... There can be many different psychological reasons, right? Lots of different ones. Some ah, because I, f I feel uh, I become alone, I am, uh, I am afraid, uh, mm -hmm. I, am, uh, I feel guilty for him uh, because I okay. don't want to... So you have self-sacrifice, there's abandonment, yes. there's... Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> if, in this case, you refer her to a psychotherapist for a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the couple relationship, she takes the role of uh, the wrong person, the person who m must change, who is uh, 
Well, she does need to change some. She does need to take better care to be a stronger, sturdier person for herself. Mm -hmm. Not for him, but for herself. So that she can make choices that she wants to make, mm -hmm. that she needs to make. A lot of women go into psychotherapy when they're living with a narcissist and suddenly they get healthier. And they look at the relationship and they think, I don't want this anymore. And that's when the narcissist goes and gets help. Because now there's leverage. Mm -hmm. Now he doesn't have this weak little woman over there that, you know, is going to stay no matter what. Now he has a woman who's healthy and she's a little stronger and he might actually lose her. And now he's terrified. She's got leverage. And she knows it. So she doesn't use it like manipulation, just happens to be there. So now she can make the choice. He says, no, no, I'll get help, I'll get help, I'll get help. She says, okay, we'll give it one more try. And this is when they get help. And if you have the right therapist for the narcissist, then things might work. <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good therapists that work with narcissists. <laughs> so then it usually falls apart. But at least she's healthier, right? So at least if she leaves, she leaves healthier. <laughs> so that can happen. Um, that's what you want to see happen. Not that she'll leave, but that she's just healthier so she can look at her relationship, really look at it and say, do I want to be here? And I have some women who say, yeah, I still want to be here because it's better than being out there. I know it's lonely, but I'm okay. I've got good friends. I have lots of things I love to do. And they mean it. They're not detached. They, they, they've done the work. And... It's what they choose for now. Maybe next week they'll choose something else, but at least they're in a healthier mode. Mm -hmm. right? I want to get them to a healthy mode no matter what. Whether they're with the narcissist, they're alone, they're with who, no matter what. I want them to be in a healthy position so that they can make their own choices freely, you know, in terms of what they deserve, what every human deserves. What was uh, your, um, your most significant experience uh, when you were <laughs> running the shelter? Oh. Well, that was a long, long time ago. It was in graduate school. Ah. Um, and right after graduate school, I took the job for about a year and a half, and I was running a battered women's shelter then. I guess the most significant experience to me was that all women get abused. You know, that it's not, not all women, all women of various colors and socioeconomic backgrounds and religions, and that there was no one was immune You know, that there were women that came from all different walks of life that would show up at that shelter. And I guess it helped me to appreciate that this was a big problem, that it wasn't just a problem of the poor or a problem of the minorities. It was a problem of women, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that I mean, I'm, I'm a very big advocate for, you know, the anti-violence acts against women and human trafficking issues and anti-pornography and all that. I mean, so... I'm a big believer in protecting the exploitation of women. And at the same time, I'm an expert in narcissistic men, you know, because I do think that it has to start with good parents that educate little boys to feel healthy enough in themselves that they don't have to be so powerful over women, that they can respect themselves and respect women and respect other people. And so maybe that's how it makes sense to me. But for me in the shelter what it was most obvious was just I was impressed with how powerful and strong these women were in spite of all the danger that they lived with mm -hmm. how incredibly resourceful they were even when they were suffering and that it happens to all kinds of women not just one type mm -hmm. and that it's hard work it's hard to change I mean I used to always ask the question what does it take for them to really... Oh, I do by myself, don't you? It's okay. You can no, thank you. Get it upstairs. There's a dishwasher. And <laughs> that's it. You want to <laughs> keep that? Mm. You can. Yes, you can. <laughs> thank you, Alex. You're thank welcome. you, Leonard. We'd always ask ourselves, the therapists in the shelter, what does it take? You know, why do some women seem to be able to leave those abusive relationships and others keep going back? because we had some who would come back and forth in and out of the no. shelter many times. And it seemed that for some, the change would happen when the children would get hurt. So as soon mm -hmm. as the child, if they had children, and now the child was in danger, then they would leave. That was it. They were very protective of their children. But, you know, it was a tough, that was a tough experience. 
I was so young, yes. Mm, I was in my 20s. <laughs> So it was hard to see. And at but the I learned time, a lot. <laughs> at that time, uh, the, there were the first researches on the subject. That we didn't even have a, a law against yes. it then. It was only in the civil courts. It wasn't even in the criminal courts. Uh -uh. We were fighting for it to go into the criminal courts. And back then, it was only a civil offense in the family courts. Mm -hmm. And the judges were men. And the judges would just, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then a woman is killed the next week by the man that he let go back into the house. Uh, it was just so frustrating. It's very depressing, actually. Laws are better now, but there was no laws then to protect the women, really. I mean, there was restraining orders, but mm -hmm. there was no real consequence. There was no real leverage, mm -hmm. you know, to get change. Uh, Wendy, you have been very, very, very... Uh, generals. Uh, Thank you very I much. I appreciate your interest in the subject. I do.